Who has used or understands um, BEM syntax? Right, cool. So maybe half. So I've got one slide um, to explain it, and then the rest is on. <laughs> I just put that in too. Um, cool. So um, yeah, at Invada, we've uh, sort of uh, developed and experimented with a new way of writing our CSS, and it's given us a huge amount of advantages um, to be able to uh, allow um, non devs to write um, code. So. What it's done, it's solved an issue that um, has been bothering us since we adopted BEM maybe two and a half years ago. Um, and it's now removed a lot of ambiguity from our code so people can understand it without needing to dive in and understand CSS a lot. Um, and it, the best thing is it's allowed us to build a really, really super flexible UI library. Um, and it's enabled those less skilled in front-end development practices to be productive um, in our code base. So, um, like Michael said, my name's Jordan. Um, I work at Envato and I'm also the co-organizer of our Melb CSS. And part of my job is to make it easier for all developers and designers to build really flexible UIs. So, that'll feed in today. So, I work on the Envato market team of Envato. Um, these are our sites. We're an online marketplace for um, buying and selling digital goods. And what I'm going to talk about today has actually been in production for maybe two and a half years. So, um, it works and it scales and it's... Um, We've got about 60 devs using it on a daily basis, so it's it's really easy to understand and use. So, so what I want to do today is I want to um, explain the problem that we found with BEM syntax, and I won't dive deep on BEM itself. Like I said, I've got one slide to try and enlighten everyone, and then I'll dive right in. Um, but it's not too crazy. Uh, so we're going to look at how we can um, improve uh, the problems that we found and find a better solution, uh, and we'll do this by um, thinking differently and looking at variations versus modifiers because um, that was some key notes there. So, so then I'll recap the end and then I'll share some resources to get you going and um, let's dive right in. So the problem with BEM syntax. So what is BEM? So BEM stands for Block Element Modifier and it's, a, it's actually a methodology rather than a syntax. There's a few sort of versions you can use like slightly different um, depending on what blog you read. And it's a popular naming convention to use in your CSS and your HTML. Um, I don't have a problem with the methodology itself, but um, I'm just going to focus on the modifier part today, which is um, really what gave us some issues. So, so this is the 101. Uh, so um, block element modifier. So say we had a form. Form's our block. And inside our block we've got children, and then those children might have grandchildren, and they might have stuff nested. But if we call a block, um, the form a block, and then you can have a modifier. So we've got a, a special theme of the form for MELP CSS. So that would be a modifier of our form. Um, or we could have a simple form, which is a slightly different look. And then inside our form we've got a button, an input. So the double underscores um, indicate that it's a child um, of the parent block. Um, and the double hyphens um, represent it's a modifier. So if you think underscores are nested and modifiers is just a change of something, um, it should uh, help you understand what I'm talking about. So. Modifiers can be applied to the block itself, or to the children, or the elements, I guess they're called. Um, you can see uh, you might have a disabled submit form, or a disabled submit form inside the MELB CSS themed form. So you get the idea. It's just a naming convention. It might take a bit to wrap your head around, but um, once you get it, um, you might run into some issues. So the problem is that BEM modifiers are used in two different ways. Um, you can have multiple classes chained together, so you can have button, button green, button large. It's a lot of repetition. Or you could just have button primary, which like it abstracts all their logic away and just gives you a nice big green button or something. So we'll dive in. Um, so while, whilst both of the techniques are valid, but they lend themselves to different uses. So having two conventions using identical syntax in the same code base is really, really confusing. And it might lead to unwanted um, styles. Um, you might clash with your own code and have um, specificity just ruining a, a, a look. So, so look at the single class. So like I said, it's just one class. There's nothing else. Um, and it wraps all the logic and modifications into a single class. So a button primary, we want it to be big and green and look great. So the benefits of doing this, it's great, is um, it's easy to understand at a glance what's happening. It puts all the logic into the CSS. So um, if you're a, uh, you know, if you don't like CSS, this is good for you. Um, and it makes use of SAS extends, if you use SAS, that is. Um, 
I'm aware that there's a lot of new techniques that have come out in the last year which sort of make this redundant, but not everyone can use these great new techniques. So it is still um, here to stay. So I'll talk about these more. Um, and it's best suited for modules that only need to make one modification at a time. So on the left is our SAS. Um, you can see we've got a button with some styles, and then we've got a button primary which sort of extends our button and adds some more stuff. And then what we get is we get all this mixed um, CSS on the right. Um, we've got things um, sort of uh, nesting, to, uh, grouped together, and then overriding. And it's really easy to get into a mess once you go down this path. Um, I've seen it really blow out. Then we've got multiple classes. So this is your chaining classes together to style something. So say you want a button that's big and green. You go button, prim button, button primary. But you'll notice I've repeated the word button twice. So it gets redundant, and especially if you've got a really, really long sort of um, version of a button, you could repeat button like a dozen times and it's just pointless. So having multiple classes does mean that source ordering could become a problem. If you put your one before the other, it could have a completely different outcome than what you expect. So the benefits of having multiple classes, um, all the logics in the HTML, it's sort of like inline styles. You can build something as you need it without having to write any CSS, which is, which is a good outcome. Um, you can configure any given module on the fly, um, change the color of a button, change the size of some text, um, and it's best suited for your modules with multiple modifiers that are designed to mix and match. So perfect for UI libraries. So the CSS for this, um, as you can see, or you if you can't see, um, it's identical except for some curly braces and some semicolons. So this is a very simple version, but um, there's no changes. Uh, the specificity, specificity issues are uh, lessened if you look after what you're doing, and but ordering can still become a problem because you might have font color in one, uh, font size in one, and font size in another, and then whatever goes last sort of will take effect. So. We set out to find a better solution. We thought this is silly. Um, we're confusing ourselves. We're confusing others. There's got to be a way to do this better. And then, well, after a lot of research, um, what if I told you that single and the multiple classes are completely different things, but yet this whole time we've been treating them as one, and we're trying to fit a round peg in a square, or oh, square peg in a round hole, for example. So that's a, it's a, that was a big moment for me when I thought, oh my god, we're actually, I've been following what people say on the internet without questioning it. I questioned it and then it was a complete breakthrough. So it has, we've been stuck with a syntax that hasn't allowed us to freely express our code. And so what it leads to is, let's think of a single class as a variation and multiple classes are your modifiers. I'll go into these. So, but if you take those thoughts, you take BEM, you get BEVM, which is block element variation modifier. So it looks confusing, um, but it's, it makes life so much simpler. So variations, what are they? So according to the Oxford Dictionary, they're a different or a distinct form of, or version of something. So it's completely different. You're not really modifying it, you're changing it. Uh, and then this is one sort of key sort of turning point where we realized that we were trying to make modifiers vari variations. Um, so what we do, it's the same old syntax as our old classical BEM modifiers. Um, and it's best suited, again, for modules that really um, only need to be changed like have one thing changed at a time. So it still looks the same, but instead of calling it a modifier, we're calling it a variation. And the rules on this are, you can only apply one at a time, uh, so you don't want to sort of have button primary, button large, it's just one at a time and you won't have any trouble. Uh, you don't need to repeat the base class, you don't need to go button, button primary, it's just button primary. Sort of like um, how we explained earlier. And then again, you can use SAS to extends to sort of clone something and then extend upon it or you could just rewrite it yourself. So, uh, and you can combine with modifiers. So I've got some code coming up after which will explain this more. So then we've got, we've got our variations, which are if you want to do something completely different, and you, it's a vari variation. If you want to make a slight tweak, say make the size large or make the color green or do whatever, you're really modifying it. So a modifier, according to the Oxford Dictionary, is a thing that makes a partial or minor change to something. So again, um, Whoop. There's our thing. So uh, the logic is again kept in the HTML, so you can write and configure modules in your HTML. You don't need to care or even know about what the CSS is doing. You just trust you've had some smart developers build it well, and then um, uh, the source ordering shouldn't matter. Um, uh, so giving, uh, yeah, and again, it's best suited for UI libraries and things that you mix and match things. So. 
It's got a new uh, syntax. So um, going back, you'll notice that there's a class and a space and a hyphen. You're like, what the hell's that? I've never seen that before. Um, first time I saw it, I'm like, who is this idiot that wrote this? Then I looked into it, and I realized, oh wait, they're really smart. So you can use a lot of different things to write classes. Like um, it doesn't have to be words and things or oh, oh, letters. Um, so what we got? We've got a leading hyphen to denote that it's, yes, I'm a, I'm a trainable modifier. If you see me, you can put as many other things on this class as that you like. Then there's a namespace, which is sort of describes the change that's going to happen. So if you want to change the color of your buttons, it'll be dash color. And this could change the font color or the background color or anything that might have to do with color. Um, or it could be size, and that could be like font size, border radius, you know, it's as long as you group things together, it's fine. Um, and then you've got a descriptor. So your descriptor should be generic. You shouldn't say green, it should be primary. You, or you shouldn't say 16 pixels, it should be large, or whatever you want to call it. So try and be generic, that way you'll have freedom to sort of change your styles down the track. So the golden rule um, is that chainable modifier should never modify the same property twice for a given module. So for example, um, if you've got a, a dash color something and a dash size something, they should never ever override each other. So if you put something, it shouldn't matter what order things happen, and that way you won't clobber your styles and things just won't go crazy. Um, and it's really bulletproof. Once you've written your CSS implementation, you can't ruin it. Um, so these are some examples. So let's look at the top. We've got a button, which is plain old boring button. But if you want um, prim a color primary, it turns it green. Color primary size large, you get a large one. Then you go color primary size large width full. It, it, your width full. So we're building it in the HTML. We don't have to write any CSS to do this. Um, and it's you might notice that Bootstrap sort of has something like this, but they repeat button, button color, button size. It's it's a bit messy. So it's nice, short, concise syntax. And again, um, see the golden rule for rule number one. That's don't uh, modify the same property twice. Um, use a namespace which describes your change, like color, width, size, whatever. Um, Play with it. It sort of it depends on what you're building is what you'll do, um, and use generic descriptions. So don't be very specific where it might lock you in down the track. Um, so you might think, well, won't that find? Well, won't, won't that make things really hard to find if I've got, you know, size large on my buttons, my typography, my everything? Um, it's going to be scattered throughout the code base, and the answer is not at all. So. Using a really, the most simple, it's probably the only regular expression I've bothered to learn. It's um, pretty much what you're looking for, part one, dot plus, the rest of it, and it'll find um, throughout your code base any one line that actually has both of those on the same line. So it, it doesn't matter what source order you're looking for. If you want to find a large button, um, you don't, if there's color in the middle, um, you might have trouble just doing a regular search for it. So. Yeah, that's, um, that's the solution that actually makes this usable on such a large code base. So to recap, um, variations and modifiers are completely different, so let's treat them like they are. Um, so block element variation and modifier is um, what we've found really works for us. And in the end, we've only got one or two variations. By the time we sort of took this approach, we realized that we don't extend anything anymore. We sort of just um, have trainable modifiers. And it's allowed us to clean up our UI library a lot. And, um, you could really just ditch variation if you didn't want it. Um, so how do we get here? So um, at the start, we had button, button green, button large. So a lot of chaining, a lot of repetition. And then we sort of had the option where we could just, let's just do all the styles um, in the CSS and just have one class. And again, they did the same job, but they were felt wrong. So now we've got our chainable modifiers that allow us to chain things without um, being very verbose. So, um, so you, combining variations and your modifiers, uh, I've talked about it, this is what it looks like, so this is real code. So um, button, we've got flat buttons and 3D buttons in our code, so by we've got a variation, so button 3D has just got that extra drop shadow sort of look and feel to it, and then all the modifiers are the same, they just work as um, normal. So we've got a lot of flexibility, um, like I said, we've only got a few and this is one of them, um, but we could put a lot more if we wanted, but um, we haven't found the need. So special mentions, I um, do want to forget these guys, state classes, helper and utility classes and your JS hooks. Again, they're all other classes that can live in your code base. Um, state and utility are also a form of modifier. Uh, due to their high priority nature, we should put them at the end so they, they can really override everything. And most of the time in your uh, code, you should 
use them. Like we use a lot of important on these things, so it takes precedence no matter where it's put in the code. Um, JS hooks are just um, just in your code to be able to hook into the JavaScript, so they don't have any style, so we don't have to worry too much about them. Uh, so in a worst case scenario, this is what you could find in the code base: so JS hook, block element modifier, variation modifier, H helper is state. So that's these are all the things we're working with. Um, so there's a lot of things out of our control, but the system we've created allows us to um, take back that control and be confident what's going to happen to our styles. So the benefits, recapping, you can build a super flexible UI. We haven't really used the modifiers much outside of our UI library because you really don't need to when you're writing custom. Like we're trying to replace most of our code with our UI library. Um, you can configure modules in the HTML rather than in CSS and creating special snowflakes every time you need something. Uh, it's short, concise syntax without a lot of repetition. And it reduces the amount of CSS that you need to write. So once it's written, you rarely have to go back and revisit it. Um, it increases development speed, and you can still use variations, like I said, if you want, but I think they're almost redundant now. So works with helper and state classes, and it's groupable. So you can search for buttons that are large in your code base, even if the words aren't next to each other. So it's quite, quite good. So a live demo. Of Give a quick demo. So I've talked about buttons. Buttons are pretty much your stock standard example when people wheel out to talk about um, naming conventions. So, um, so things we've got, we do it to things like our forms. So you've got an e-form. I don't know if this is going to break things. Probably. Um, so we've got layout vertical in line, layout vertical, layout horizontal. So um, you can use them on. Um, a lot of things like all our inputs, like type string, type password, type, I don't know, font mono if you're trying to do something fancy. But um, there's a lot of different sort of um, users for it, uh, retainable modifiers. So we look at uh, like our modals. Modals, once you break them down, they're really simple. You've got a header, a section, and a footer. They're not too bad. But in each of those, you can apply a background color of light, mid, or dark. So it's just modal section, background, mid, modal section, background, dark, and you can use that on any of the things. Border radius, again, you could do things like radius none, radius top, radius bottom, uh, and you can build this on the fly. So say for some reason you need to cut the radius off the bottom, you don't, you're not writing happy CSS to do it, you just got a, a modifier to do it. Things like width and all that, um, this is just a very basic example, probably another, I'll show one more, it's your icon. So we've got E icon and then icon dash alert and stuff like that. So it allows us to really um, you know, clean up our code and not have like horrendously long class names everywhere. So um, yeah, but I'll jump back to this. Um, if you want to see more of that after, just come and find me and I'll show you. It's not public yet, that um, our style guide, but if you look through our code base, just view source on Envato Market, you'll see it everywhere. So some resources, I've written a whole blog post that explains it much better than I um, ever could standing here. Um, uh, then there's uh, another one called Sassy Ben Modifies, which sort of, I think it's the first place I saw the word Bevan coin, so I'll give them credit. And then uh, another great article by Ben Smith, who also works at Envato, on um, using multiple classes um, versus your extend for your singles. So again, thanks. Um, we're always looking for designers, developers, product people. Um, there's me and a few other people here, so come find us at the back afterwards if you're interested. Um, and thank you very much. This is how you find me. Any questions?